Okay, so um, Axel, you should be able to, to begin uh, sharing your screen now. Um, and uh, just, 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 oh. just while, while you're going through that process, I'm going to continue talking, okay? So, uh, so welcome can everybody. Can I start, share? Go on, Axel. Uh, the, share, the share screen, can I do that now? Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. So welcome everybody to uh, the second installment of the England Havel Coach webinar series. We're, we're extremely lucky today to be joined by uh, Axel Norgard from uh, Skanderborg Handball. Uh, as you, if you've been on the call, you already know that Axel is, is quite the personality uh, with a huge amount of experience and connections all across uh, the world of handball, in fact. Um, and I'm, I'm really fortunate that I've been able to spend a lot of my own personal handball journey with Axel uh, out in Denmark. Um, Axel's going to be talking today around uh, some tactical considerations for positional attack. Um, but throughout the presentation, you'll notice that uh, he is often referring to the um, intertwining of psychological uh, aspects as well as the technical, physical, uh, and, and probably more social things. Um, Axel's just having a small problem, I think, uh, in sharing the. Yeah. You found it, Axel? Uh... What do I do? You have to help me here. Yeah, just open the, click on the, the webinar in GB, this one. You can see it on your desktop. The, this is one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although he's an expert in all things handball, his, uh, his, his technical uh, <laughs> Sorry, guys. knowledge is, is somewhat limited, but no, his, uh, the presentation is going to be excellent. Yeah, yeah, so Axel, um, that's my introduction done. It's, uh, it's over. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, and all the best here from Aarhus uh, in Denmark, uh, where um, my connection to British handball through the last 15 years and international handball has opened up for this session. I'm trying to do my best. It's uh, very uh, important for me to say that although I'm nearly 70, uh, I don't consider myself as an old man in handball. My job right now is uh, that I'm coaching the coaches and I'm kind of supervisor for the Danish league team that has been connected to Skanderborg Handball with the academy uh, for 10 years now. And I'm working very much with players and coaches and teams uh, still. I'm still on the bench. I'm a former uh, head coach myself. And now I'm using my experience uh, from that point of view but it's very important also to tell you that uh, it's not, uh, I'm not an old experienced man building up uh, a lot of stories from uh, years ago. Uh, I th I'm still in a learning phase. So I think that uh, my philosophy is that uh, hopefully also with you, that when I start up a season with a startup with a new team, I start up from zero because uh, people around me are new. Uh, maybe there's 10 uh, old players and then there's six new players. And only one player, a new player in the team, for my point, is back to zero, back to start. And that's uh, my whole approach and attitude to look upon uh, learning and uh, executing things. Uh, it's starting from that. I hope you... I I don't hear that interruption. Bear with me a second. Bear with me a second. Um, I'm going to do something. Bear with me a second. Um, Should I Axel, continue? Can, can you speak now? So I've muted everyone except yourself. Okay. And Bobby. Okay. Yeah. So I can continue. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll move on now to the slides and uh, hopefully in general you can uh, give me kind of feedbacks but uh, maybe I should start uh, with uh, introducing my whole philosophy and the idea about it. So uh, the next one you can see here is that when I'm turning and the basic starting for all kind of uh, learning and improving is that we start in the bottom of this triangle here that's not the whole philosophy that you could have three, from my point of view, three different focuses for learning and for matches. You can naturally have the top of it, and it's a part of it, the result focus. But uh, you could also have a process focus, and you could have a performance focus. 
My idea is when we're talking about learning, the whole basic about it is that we have to start from the bottom and use the focus for every type of learning, every type of improving is to start from the bottom. You create results through working, first of all, individually on the position with the personal skills. That's your performance focus. And then you take the next steps into the process focus, which is your team. It's, it's a part, it has to be integrated in the, the process focus. That's your team playing, your team skills, and that will make some kind of a result. You can see to the left or to the right, you please, from my point of view, is a good advice, and that's how we've done very much uh, more and more. It's coming from the bottom whenever we are meeting and talking about improving on positions because the major control you have as a coach related to the player or the player, it's your performance uh, your, and your process. Your results, it's also depending, it's always depending on others. It's out of your hands most of the time. You can have a ref who's a problem, you can have a good goalkeeper, you can have another opponent which you can't control, but you can control your performances and your processes. So, so that's, that's my basic. Another basic is that um, in that situation, we are leaving the platform of talking about results. We are only talking about, uh, not about winning or losing. We are talking about lose. No, as Mendelssohn and Letter said, we don't lose anything. Either we win or learn. Hopefully you can see that connected to the triangle before. So, and the next basic is that from my point of view, handball in action is a combination of what you think in your head and what you do with your body. And you have to connect these two things, what's going on in your head, and uh, you have to uh, go in action. It's some behavior related. Uh, that's the main focus for all the things. And it's not your head and it's not your body as a coach. It's the players on the position's head and it's the player on the position's body you have to be focused on. Makes sense, hopefully. So in that sense, I'd like to introduce you to uh, uh, things that I think uh, uh, is one of the big issues uh, and I've been working on that kind of philosophy called uh, the inner game philosophy uh, between coach and player. And it's very much inspired by uh, Mr. John Whitmore. You know his books, uh, or I'll recommend uh, these books for you. Uh, in this sense, what you're talking about here, the inner game of golf, the inner game of tennis, the inner game of skiing. There's a lot of transformation to, from my point of view, to what we're working on uh, from this philosophy, especially uh, the, uh, the definition of performance because in his sense, performance is a demonstration of skills. And you must, as a coach, in that sense, I'll bring it in later on, more precise to the special uh, uh, positions. Uh, you must find a situation as a coach where you can create true achievement. Uh, and we are working about uh, the mutuality between you as a coach to, to um, Go for the highest standards on each position. What is the highest standards on every position and co connected to the person you have on the position? That's a very individual matter. And it's very interesting uh, from my point of view to work on that because there's so big difference. Do you have a left wing uh, nearly two meter or do you have a very fast left wing only 175? And so there's a big difference between the two left wingers of that type and their definition of high standards. So could you make a top 10 for your own players back home, no matter what level they have, what is the highest standards? And that's what we will try to achieve. And uh, then uh, this whole inner game philosophy starts up because uh, how do we make our efforts? It's our inner game in our heads, who is the interesting one. And if you're a coach or working as a coach, you are talking to the inner game in the player on the position in his head or in her head. What is actually going on? Because according to Mr. John Whitmore, we have uh, 
two uh, types. I'll come back to that. Of inner, we have an inner game between two selves. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, and there could be some disruption. And it's very interesting that your whole communication have that uh, approach. Axel, so, can I just interrupt yeah. you for one second? Yeah. We had a request uh, if we can um, make the slides in full presentation mode. So if you go to the slideshow option on the bottom of your screen. Sorry. Oh, yeah, up here. Uh, I can take it from there. Yeah. And uh, I think you just double click while you're in presentation mode to skip on. Yeah. But I can move this. Uh, yeah. Let's try that. Thank you. So the first building stone is when we are talking about performance and uh, in, uh, related to improve on your position. You must create a situation about uh, enjoyment and learning. Think about that enjoyment and learning. So build up a, a platform where you feel safe uh, no matter what situation you are in. Is that good? Do you have the next one now? Yeah. Yeah. John Whitmore, Mr. John Whitmore, he's talking about when, what is, what is the situation when we are working with the players on the pits, on their position, very from a technical, cyclical point of view. What kind of uh, things do we have? Yeah, we have a, an inner game between self one is the teller. Try to look down there. The teller gives instruction, is self-critical, et cetera, et cetera. And the doer is doing things just uh, with the body. So hopefully you can see to, to the left, it's very about the head, which interrupts you and you're in a game there. And to the right, you have uh, the, t the doer who's doing things. So uh, Mr. John Whitmore said, if when you want to move uh, people from A to B, you have to be very much focused that the whole communication in your coaching is go to the right. Talk to self too, talk to the doer, talk to the body. So it's a new definition from now on uh, with the word body language. Hopefully you can accept that uh, in that situation, okay? And he's talking about a very interesting thing that uh, if we have to make a top 10 on each position, what is, um, what is the tool, what is the keyword? He's working with, uh, with, with the word called critical variables. On each position, you have a number of critical variables. That's a small technical details, which is important for each position. What is the critical variables? Uh, on the left wing, on the line, uh, on the playmaker position, on the goalkeeper position, on the back uh, players. What is the critical variables? What is the top 10? And please remember, it's very much related, the top 10, to the body and the head you're talking to. It's not a general one. It's very much related in this sense or this way of looking upon things to the small left wing, to the tall left wing, to uh, the line, two types of line players in Scannerball. We have two types, very good line players. We have one two meter line player and we have one smaller one, 180. Uh, we are working with two, 10 numbers, personal numbers of critical variables for each of their players, because they are different. Their body are different, their head are different. That's the whole issue for us to, uh, and we have that going on all the time in our interactive communication in the coaching team. What type of communication do we need for the small line player according to the tall line player? Because we are working on two uh, very personal levels. I'll continue. Here we have an example of general critical variables in the handball you can see them just looking down the page looking down the slides uh, when we are communicating what is critical variable something about the ball the speed uh, the power the time the clarity and things like that so um that's that's what we need to use here is the three criteria uh, when you work with critical variables and it's, I think it's a big challenge for us through my career as a coach. It's very late in my career that I can see that my whole communication has been changed little by little from maybe the instructive sentences to the players using my picture of what you must do 
and then uh, more find out uh, what's actually going on in your head and your body on the position. So what is relevant? It's not relevant for you, maybe. It's a combination between what is relevant for you naturally as a coach, but also on the position. So you have to, to follow these three very, very interesting uh, criteria for, for choosing out the relevant critical vari vari uh, variables in each situation and on each position. And you'll get a lot of information by looking about that. So um, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, so you can say you will take a step. It's very interesting to learn, yeah. But now we are moving a step back. We are talking about that each player must learn how he learns the things, how she learns. So, and every time we are in a situation like that, there's these three important things. You have to be awareness. We have to have awareness. Uh, what is the knowing the present, present situation with clarity, very precise. What, what are we working on here of these critical variables? And then we have to make some choices. The player has to make some choices. And you, as a very good coach, you will put them in a situation where you will have maybe two or three or four uh, possibilities for an action on a position. And he had to pick up the best for him. But the decision is his, it's not yours. You have to build up some critical variables about the position because he believes in you, he trusts you because you have built up that relation from the start. In Scannabor, uh, when we were uh, throughout the last year, we have been working very much on this because just to explain what's going on in Scannabor, we ended up this season as number six, but we have maybe the lowest or the next lowest budget, uh, according to the all of Danish clubs. We have, uh, you could say from that point of view, with the great respect of our players, we are not choosing the first. We have players on level two or level three who maybe have been sitting on a bench for a one, one or two seasons in a top four club. Then they decided, no, I won't go there. I'd like to go to Skanderborg because here I'll get the chance. So we have to work on a different level with these players because one way or another, they have been deselected from a top 14, but they have a lot of skills. But the possibility of um, developing that in a top four club was not, a po impos was not possible. Then they're coming to us. So we, we need this approach to find out. And we have been very lucky the last years that we have actually changed a lot of these players from sitting on the best to be, to be start seveners on most positions by working on their terms little by little because they're actually coming to us with a lot of guts to achieve and to be better because they have an inner uh, game and an inner game in their head about I don't, I don't like the situation I've been in through the last two seasons. I'd like to improve now. So in that sense, they are very open when they are coming to us. This is one of the days, what is one of the things we have been working on the last two seasons, these schedules in front of you. The phenomenon is, uh, how do you consider yourself your very best knee on your position? What is that? Uh, what do you think by looking at others, role models, very good players, yourself or things, what do you think the critical variables, the top 10 on the position for you, what is that? Something you are able to do now and small details you can put on uh, yourself. And when we are looking at players in that sense, we are looking at them. Can you see from three point of views here in this schedule? Naturally, the one is my very best knee in action on my position. What am I able to do? Where is it? How is it? When is it? Who am I working very close with? That's on the position. And please remember, and we're talking about players, it's not when they only have the ball. It's before they receive the ball, it's when they have the ball, it's after they have uh, done something with the ball. What do they do? Actually, a left winger, a line player, 
you know in four or five passes, according to the game right now, you will know in four or five passes, you will maybe be the one who will receive an assist from one of your team players. What are you actually doing? Four passes before you got the ball, three passes before you got the ball, two, where are you on the, on the pitch? What are you doing with your arms, your body? All these critical variables is very important to have in mind when we are working on a positional level. It's not only when they have the ball, what are they actually doing before? Maybe that's a small detail for some of the players who ha they haven't been thought about before. And maybe this is the key word about their timing and things like that. It's actually what they're doing before. Uh, so, and then the, com, coming back to this schedule, the good day, the definition is one, naturally on your position, but it's also um, what are you doing in one of your best matches? What is this actually when you are giving assists to some of your teammates? What is the top 10 there? Because you're, and then when you are receiving team uh, assists from your teammates, what's uh, the very best day, the very best version, the very best you? What is typical characteristics, critical variables for these situations? We have asked this season, actually here in the middle of the season, um, because we have an integrated team. Most of the players have been there now for two seasons only two, two or three, four, in and out uh, for every season. So it's very important that we have been using this kind of issue. And it has given us a very lot. So each of the players this season in January between uh, the autumn uh, half and the spring half got this schedule in front of you. Please go back home and in a week we'd like you to fill this out. So we have to point this out personally, and then you have to be ready to meet some of your teammates, who you are assisting, who you are receiving assists from. And they, you have to have a discussion about what's in each and every schedule. How do you look upon yourself? And how do your colleagues look upon you? And just uh, to tell you, uh, it created a lot of uh, innovative thinking because some of the players naturally have written something about themselves in the first, uh, with the very best me in action. But some of his colleagues said, hey, I think you have forgot one or two. Have you thought about when we had this match, you actually did something we didn't have, we haven't seen very much of that. Oh, I haven't thought about that. I think that's number two instead of the one you have put yourself in number two. And then, can you see, we also had, hopefully, we have a very constructive discussion about having assist, giving assist. Is that also the characteristic for me as a player? Yes. It's not on the result, coming back to the beginning of this lesson. No, it's your process. It's your, um, it's your, uh, uh, what, did I, what, what did I had number one? It, it's your um, performance your personal performance, I'm very much interested in. And this, this is integrated in our team. So by using, filling out this schedule in front of you right now, you can see we both have the performance, individual performance, and we have, uh, you have to discuss that also in the context of your team and the game plan of your team. Hopefully you can understand that. So we had a very constructive discussion about that. Um, and some of the players actually were a bit surprised that the that their colleague, he was he was talking to him four times a week, playing two two matches a week. That he had seen this, he had observed this. Although they've been talking together a lot of things, but he was a surprise. Uh, two or three things I haven't heard about, I haven't thought about that you have this point of view that you have looked upon me from that point of view. So on the small details, it creates uh, small. Uh, improvements individually and also collectively in the team by having a discussion like this. Talking to, uh, you can see in front of this, uh, I, before I met you here today, I talked to my head coach, Mr. Nick Rasmussen, 
who has been the head coach and I've been supervising him the last two seasons. And we talked about uh, how do we, from a Scannerball point of view, look upon uh, critical variables. What is important for us when we look upon players who must uh, cope and must be able uh, to work with critical values? What, 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 what's their top 10 on each position? And then we have put it in this matrix, in, also in, in the phases of a match. So you can see just by looking down here that it is some of the things that some of the players have been written in their schedule the slide before. And here we have examples of what they actually were talking about. What is important for me if I'm a line player, I'm I need you as a playmaker, our cooperation, our way of uh, making rash, uh, um, our may, a way of making one another even better. That's by knowing very precisely what is your critical variables in your cooperation with me and vice versa. And here you have examples of what's, what's uh, Mr. Nick Rasmussen's point of view according to our team right now. You can see that later on. I don't want to go through each and every one, but uh, hopefully you can see that here we have examples of critical variables. And then we can take a step down. You can take, uh, go, go down to one of these and you could say, for instance, organized attack, go down to playmaker in attack. Uh, what is important for him? Uh, strategic skills. Yeah, what is that? What is a critical variable called strategic skills? What is that? And then you can have a discussion according to the way he's a playmaker. What, what, what do I want? What do we want? Uh, the team from you, from your top 10, your critical variables, talking to the strategic skills. What is your shooting? Uh, smart skills. What is that? Can you see that? So that's, that's what we can, what we can work on and we can tear each and every one down again and again and again to get it related to each and individual person. Hopefully you can see that. And when we ended up with this schedule, this, not the one before, but the one with the individual schedule, we actually put all these individual point of views, maybe each player's top three or top four, we put that in a big matrix and handle it out to the players so they can see uh, before a match, before a training, what uh, I'm a right back, I have a right wing, uh, as one of my assist players, I have a line player, I have a playmaker. What is his uh, point of view? Uh, what do, does he, what is his critical variable? What do we actually have to work on right now? Because we think this critical variable are called assisting and timing. It's not right there. So can you see by looking into uh, this way of working with the players, each and every drill in your trainings, is not actually only your responsibility. When you have a startup warming up the goalies, you have simple drills in the beginning. There's always two critical variables in that drill, simple drill, where the players could like, would like to improve because they can be working on one or two critical variables when they are just training fast breaks, they are just training three against two. Then they can stand there before they are having the ball, hey, we need to use this or this or this. So the communication by using this way of looking into the players is uh, changed little by little because the players, from my point of view, are taking much more ownership and responsibility for their own development together with you. You'll see that. In this situation right now, as an example, we have uh, two or three in the middle of our defense, which is maybe some of the best in Denmark when we are best, even its players from uh, a lower level. Some of the players in our team in the middle of our 6 0, other uh, teams in the league would have said he will never be a league player. But by working with his uh, colleagues here, uh, they have been communicating themselves into a so high level of understanding that they are so proactive and in front of nearly most of the other players, although it's national players, even not from Denmark. 
just by working on a very high level of communication about their uh, critical variables. So it's, you could say it's a change of culture, learning culture, by using this if uh, the players are following you, uh, your way of doing this. And it also creates naturally a situation because you can use some of your drills you used last year or the year before in your coaching. You have to change yourself all of the time. Actually starting off from zero, everything, every, every period. If we have a timeout and people are talking about things like this in a break, uh, for instance, like the winter break, then when we start up again, as a coach, we one way or another start on just by this constructive discussion on a new level. But we are starting from zero again, if I can explain myself that way. So I have to change my drills. I have to change my trainings in that situation because we have reached another level. And then we can start from zero again. So, so you'll be challenged very much from my point of view. Yeah, uh, this is my last one. And uh, because one of the guys we have been talking very much about, and I'd like to show it to you here, is our left wing. The history about Lars Korb is that he came from BSV, now called BHH, one of the national teams in Denmark. He was sitting on the bench most of the time, only got five, ten minutes in the whole season for maximum in his matches. And then he returned as a first left wing for us. And he has been working very, very much with his own critical variables, very much about uh, uh, find out what's uh, important for him. And this season, it ha he has reached one of his goals, actually, that he has been selected beyond national players in the league to be the most effective left, left wing by, and it's, 100% because he had a high, high level of um, looking upon himself and how he, first of all, likes to be assisted. Or the next one is what position he'd like to take. So I'll show you here um, the critical variables. And then we afterwards could talk about uh, what is the critical variable for a guy like Lars. You could maybe give me some uh, feedbacks on that, on his position before he got the ball when he's the last foot is on um, in front of the line where is he, when he's on his way up in the air can you accept that and he reads his top level and then he's on his way down uh, what do you think uh, what type of critical variables and what is the very best version of him uh, hopefully you're ready to see that now you can see the exam i'll just uh, let them run and then we can uh, maybe have some discussion about that afterwards. Okay, here it is. We are in green, he's on the left position right now. There he is. Next example. Yeah. Okay, uh, you can see the examples here, uh, uh, and um, hopefully you will agree that he has been, especially been working very much about his, he's talking about bringing up his, himself in a position. Before he receives the ball, he has been working very, very much uh, that he'd like to be most effective on, on very small angles. The last shot here was an example that it was a very, very small angle. And although he has a high level of uh, scores on that position, his last step we were working on, his, uh, is he shooting 
on his way up or I'm shooting on his way down. If I should give another example how we work with him in the lessons, uh, I can give it here. We were talking about a kind of reframing. When we were using these uh, simple uh, shots only with one defender and one assister, we were talking about this phenomenon. Last, now we'll have 10 shots in a row. Please tell me when the ball is leaving your hand in this situation. Tell me from a scale when you have, you can tell me, just give me a number. If it's one, then it's because the ball is leaving on your way up. If it's two, it's just before you reach the top of your jump. If it's three, it's right on the top when you are on the top of your um, jump. Four is when you're on your way a little bit down. And five is when just before you reach the floor. Don't think about scores. Don't think about the way you shoot. Just do your best. And now our critical variables is the jump and on your height. And where are you on this curve? One, two, three, four, or five. Please take 12 shots. And then you take these 12 shots. And every time you finish, you said uh, two, four. And then after we have done these 12 shots, We've had a discussion about how does, how, does he, how does he felt in his body? How was his shoulder when he shot? Because we had some special focus naturally on shot number five, for example, five, seven, and nine. Because there was something, and he said, there was something about my shots just before, between the, 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 the distinction between number three and number five. It was very interesting for me. It's something new for me. From the top of my jump, just before I reach the floor, there's something there we can work on. So this is an example of that. You can put that kind of look upon that critical variables into all kind of the position. And it's actually you as the coach who are making another frame. You're actually reframing. So naturally the shots, the result is interesting. But you are more interested in this situation here in the the uh, performance and the critical variables about the performance as if before you leave the ball leaves you what is interesting so there's an example some some uh, which we have been uh, working very much hopefully i can uh, have explained myself pretty clear uh, so in between the slides you can feel how we work Axel, that's please. It's, yep. it's, it's been uh, it's been great, and so far some of the the comments in the chat box has been uh, it's been very well received. Uh, thanks yep. for for okay. taking us through the slides and and your uh, unique approach to um, helping players develop uh, in all aspects of their game with some uh, direction towards the the tactical side. I'm going to kick things off with a question that I've got. Um, it's one that's probably more close to home for me, and given my yeah. uh, experiences with you. And then uh, Ricardo and I have seen some questions come through the chat box. But um, some of the stuff you spoke about before um, in the previous slides uh, around um, what the players are doing before they receive the ball, what they do when they have the ball, what they do after they receive the ball. Um, much of their decisions and, and ideas are going to be linked to their attention. Uh, you, you spoke a lot about attention and um, what the players are seeing and how they're responding to situations. Um, yeah. If we take that from a, a both tactical and psychological perspective, um, what's your experience been of working with, uh, and I'm looking at all the people who are the, uh, on this webinar right now, working in different uh, levels of the game, from complete, yeah. be complete beginners to um, second division teams, first division teams, whatever. Uh, yeah. you, you've actually had um, some incredible experiences in, in your lifetime, in your lifetime of coaching. Uh, how would you help the complete beginner that's never played handball before, um, start to appreciate uh, the things we talk about. Where, how would you help them divert their attention to the, the critical variables for them? Um, first of all, I would say that uh, you, naturally have to have to have, you naturally have to put uh, some pictures uh, in your mind. So uh, I would, in the beginning, from the very beginning, I would uh, show different examples of uh, first of all, a simple game on their level uh, to see 
to have some pictures. First of all, the beginning, how many on the pitch, how's the pitch, uh, two teams uh, and things like that, uh, to be related with the position. But most of this learning also, uh, according to Mr. Whitmore's way of thinking, when we are related things to, you can say, the teller, not the teller, but the doer, is that we are leaving instruction and we are going a little bit more into the game. So think about, uh, so, you, and that, then, so you have to create pictures. What would you like to do? When you, and, and before you can naturally put pictures about handball in your head, you need to have a library of pictures about that. But a little bit as a transformation, when we're looking at what the Olympics next year, uh, uh, hopefully, think, when we think about uh, players, the high jump, you can see how that's an example. Don't you agree that when we are looking, uh, the starter said, now you have one minute, then you have to start up your jump. And then uh, the high uh, jumper, he's standing there. I can picturally do this. He's standing there from the left to the right. And people think, what's going on? And then he's doing this one. Da, da. If I can explain, he's, he's actually closing his eyes. And then he is uh, having a movie inside his head about uh, a successful jump, just like here. And I think we, you can do that on all levels, but naturally you have to put some pictures uh, in, in the library. First of all, when we are talking about beginners uh, and there's people who know much more about that than I do, but I still think there is something you have to close your eyes and see what's, what's actually going on. If we are going on a holiday, also as a kid, you know that when we're going to a holiday, we haven't been there before. We are sitting in the car and the train in the plane and we have not been there before, but uh, no matter how, we are building up pictures. Oh, the hotel is there, the beach is there, uh, and things like that. So we are all the time, that's a basic one for us. We are building up pictures, uh, which where we are going, where we are swimming, when we are running. So this is a general phenom basic phenomena, uh, which also is recommended by Mr. Um, Whitmore here. Try to work more in stories and pictures and movies with yourself in a park and then imagine that because that's the fastest way from moving things you have to do from your head to your body. Thanks Axel. That's faster um, than instruction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's very interesting the use of imagery and visualization in, in the sports psychology world. Uh, really, really interesting stuff and building up those pictures. So getting them to play the games, uh, especially at their level, watching matches, all those kinds of things, really useful. Um, Ricardo, I'm going to ask you to jump in now because uh, you mentioned to me that you had a had a question to maybe frame some of the uh, presentation. Oh, well, I think I think uh, you've touched most of the points I was going to ask. Uh, my my question was more following up a few comments I've seen on the chat yeah. uh, in terms of people arguing that um, that sort of strategy would work if you were talking about high level players and wouldn't necessarily be. Uh, used in different contexts, and, and that's could be a question, but could also be a comment on you know the strategies can be adapted and adjusted to your context. I think, mm -hmm. and and I would like to to understand your 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 opinion on this, Axel. Yeah, uh, I, I will. I will. I, I'm I'm not. Uh, I will disagree about that because I've seen examples of that. Uh, I've seen, especially uh, if you. If you investigate a little bit in looking into Mr. Whitmore's inner game philosophy, you will see that it's also available for new beginners and for all types yeah. uh, about this reframing stuff. Uh, if you ask two players uh, who's not very good in passing, and then you have uh, two girls or two boys, very young, standing in front of me, and you like them in your uh, drill to pass uh, with one hand and catch and pass, and you know in the beginning it's even a problem for them. And then you could yep. start instructing them. Mr. Whitmore, he says, no, we reframe things. And he said, uh, while they are uh, passing, uh, when you are passing to the other, uh, is the ball uh, drilling? Uh, is, is the ball circling this way or this way? What color does the ball has? And things like that. So, so ask them to be focused on something a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, something others. Uh, can you see his hand? 
value and, and how many of so we frame things and yeah uh, this is a small this is the answer to give i've seen examples that that uh, just by reframing things and your own approach attitude uh, telling a story uh, instead of telling what to do it changes things and kids can actually work more automatically about that because then you're more talking to the body than to their head yeah and it's also about, about because yeah go on go on go on, go on uh, just last one is that that, that yeah uh, if you uh, kids it's so much if you're talking about instructions then the word yes that's correct no that's not correct uh, no that's better no that's not that good things like that that that's just mental yeah when you're talking to the body and we're having some games you get the answers about the ball is going uh, upside down uh, or no it's going the other way no it didn't move this time things like that they're absolutely able to do that that's that that's that's um, uh, Mr. Whitmore has very funny uh, bo both movies and uh, stories about that. But uh, I'll motivate you, encourage you to maybe uh, study that a little bit more. Yeah. Thank you, Axel. It's a bit, I think, putting the skill into context and, and reflecting on it, not just doing uh, that we're talking about here. Um, Axel, oh. if, you, if you allow me, I would go into the reading stages in the chat. Uh, there's a few questions there. And then maybe after yeah. that, uh, going to open mic season and uh, allowing anyone who wants to, to engage in, in, a, in a live voice discussion to do so. But at the moment, we have a couple of questions that uh, are quite similar in terms of uh, the, spe the specifics of, of, of the application of the methodology. Uh, mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, your own team, uh, we yeah. talk about understanding those those critical variables, defining them, and then practice them. A lot of the coaches are wondering uh, where and when is the space during the week for the players uh, to develop their own skills independently of the teamwork, and if you have any uh, specific coaches that follow them whilst they're doing it. Yeah, uh, uh, if I understand it correct, uh, it's... Um when we are together nearly every day, there's a lot of room for, for working uh, in two hours. Uh, it's naturally mm -hmm. only six against six. It's not only tactical resolve thinking. It's naturally also uh, divided. And we have naturally special coaches uh, for each and everything. So, so from this point of view, our physical chef is very much connected, especially to jump, uh, and he's working together with the assistant coach to have all the, re the position specific responsibilities about the players. But naturally, we in this situation, it's just about building up, uh, facilitating. So you are facilitating periods uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the trainings where the players uh, can get, uh, now you are together with your sister or the one you assist or you can have the defender in that situation. So it's about combining. I like uh, number two, right two in our six zero. I like he had to work a little bit more on his tackling or his ball stealing. Uh, in that situation, I'll build up a one-to-one -one between so he can work with his critical variables. And then we have a playmaker and a left wing and a line player or something else working together with him. So the way you prepare your, or your strategy for your, your lessons uh, is also very much infected on that. But you facilitate a situation, create a very simple situation, and then it's up to the players. They're actually also able to say, no, uh, can I give the assist from this position? Uh, could you maybe try to, uh, things like that. So you have a little masterclass for 10 minutes, 15 minutes uh, with the coach as a facilitator and the players being taking ownership and responsibility for the situation, because they're Perfect. working on their critical variables in the Perfect. schedule. Yeah. Uh, Axel, okay. just picking up on that, um, there's, a, there's a question here from Tavi who asks, uh, how many times uh, per year do you um, reassess those critical variables or, and, and reestablish those, those uh, schedules you've showed us at the beginning? So yeah. um, do you want to you know, shed some light on that, please? Yeah. Um, you could say that that uh, it, it's a natural and ongoing discussion. Naturally, when we are talking professional handball players, 
because our whole way of recruiting players is that in the beginning of the season, when we are talking about what's your role this season, what we like to do, then we are talking about the critical variables. Then yes. we are working on them continuously during the season. But when we have period, when we have periods for timeouts, we are actually using the timeout. A timeout is maybe it's two weeks because uh, the national team is away. Maybe it's in between between Christmas and New Year and things like that. So maybe two, three times a week we have a real timeout and have a discussion about whole our interaction in that situation. But yeah. also. I have the situation because I'm the I'm uh, the supervisor for if a player is in a period feeling well I'm in a very bad period right now from a scale from 1 to 10 I could say uh, as a supervisor hey guy don't you agree you're between 2 and 3 right now and he said yes all right should we have 10 minutes should we have a talk and a cup of coffee about your critical variables yes he said we need three cup of coffees and we need cake and we need things like that <laughs> because we really like to have a discussion about that. And then we are talking about his critical values. Can you see that? But it's also on the bench. I, I have to open it here. It's also on the bench. I'm sitting on the bench. And when a player is coming out because he's been taken out and maybe has been successful the first 15 minutes, in five minutes, he had to be ready again. In four minutes again, I have to make him ready. How do I yep. have to make him ready? A short discussion because we know the schedule. We know we know what is in the bottom. What what uh, two or three things from your own top ten critical variables, the very best of you, who we haven't seen today. What do we have to find now? What are we having to do in the do in the nearest future? This will be next time you're moving into attack or defense. What do we take from the critical values? What do we make focus? Actually, yeah. one of the players, if I would allow me, one of the players said before a match, during his warm-up, actually, I need a focus. I, there's, there's bees in my head, I, I can't focus. And then we decide, okay, let's set one or two of your critical variables. What is that? That's your fast break. That's right the moment when you are returning the midline and you're getting the ball and you are in an assisting position. What are you actually working on there from your critical variables? Thank you, he said, I don't need more. Hopefully yes. that could be an example. Yes, absolutely. There's there's a practical question uh, from Max, who yeah. goes, um, if you touch that briefly. So uh, he, he asks a very contextual situation where how would you, as an assistant coach, as a mental coach, act in a scenario uh, where you remove your reliable player who has had missed four shots during the game, uh, you're bringing the second option who is actually having a, a good game mm -hmm. and then the player you removed initially is asking to go back in. Yeah. Um, what would be your, your reaction? How would you use those critical variables reflection tool uh, yeah. you know, to, to bridge that gap and to sort yeah. the situation? Yeah. Interesting, interesting question. Also, what's behind that question? Very interesting. What thoughts are behind that question? That's very interesting for me. But thank you, uh, because uh, if we follow this situation, we have been working on this for, for some years now. It's an, an investigation. Investigation, can I use that word? Uh, yes. In your team, because it's a way of mindset going into matches. And we are not talking about that anymore, because uh, the, the players, very, very rare, by using this, they can see that every player in the period, although he's, he's your start seven or nearly every time, he can see in the period, these four, first 14 minutes, I've been very much far away from my very best me. So uh, now that we need to do something else, and I can see I have a colleague. We have been talking about how different our, uh, uh, our skills defining our way of being playmaker is we are two playmakers so now i can see so in that situation just like i told you before the startup player comes out and he knows you're a startup player so maybe in four minutes you have to return or maybe in half an hour or things like that what was the learnable you didn't lose baby you didn't lose you learn 
So yeah. what was the learning out of that? So we have a discussion, constructive discussion about that is acceptable to have a little slowdown and then others can come in. Our example is our two line players in Skanderborg are talking about tall guy, Mesh uh, Kalskop, and smaller guy, Nikolai Nielsen. They are, they are very uh, different uh, and they have a total understanding about, yeah, now I can see, now I'm pretty close, that's, I have to go in to assist him. So we're not talk, talking about uh, bringing players out, that's out of our discussion. We're not taking players out, we are bringing players in. Yeah. A really nice way to frame the yeah, absolutely. situation, Axel. And I think uh, a lot of that is the reasons the players would re respond maybe is because of the, the culture that you've cultivated at the club. It's become a much more open environment and players more willing to share their uh, frustrations. Yeah. Um, Axel, I'm going to ask one that's uh, very close to, to my heart and it's around um, how would you manage the transition for uh, an academy player, one of the young boys who's coming into the first team, um, with how would you uh, help manage their expectations and um, bring them into line with uh, the way you're working in the first team? I assume you, that you're working similarly with the, the youth players anyway, so it wouldn't be a shock? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and actually, I like the word shock. Every, the big shock is coming to be a U18 player, naturally, in all countries, as a very good player, and then be a part of a, a team where you have players from 18 to 32 with two or three kids and jobs and things like that. And then you're coming in as a, that's a natural, more an existential. Uh, so you have to work on that very on a long-term work. So in that sense, when we are uh, inviting people to our academy and he's coming in as a playmaker, he's, you, he's 15 years old, he's in our U16 team then it's important for us to tell him that from now on, we are naturally working on daily trainings and matches on the U16 team. But at the same time, we have a strategic long-term thinking plan that right now we have Martin Belling, who is a very important player on the playmaker position. He's 31, he has two, year, uh, two kids and things like that. But in four years, in three years, the idea is that you should challenge his position. And we tell Martin Belling that. Martin Belling. So when you, and sometimes they are training together. We are building up trainings together. So we have four or five players from the U16 and U17 team who are very good. We have very, very good players at that level naturally. So they are part of the training. And when they are part of the training, Martin Belling knows that he's a role model for the kid of U16. So they need to have a talk about it. And at that time, so we have little by little to tell them that um, it's, it's, you have to build a culture under your skin about that because it's, it is a shock. And, and, and I don't have the, the total solution about that because that's also a frustration. But somebody said that the definition of a frustration is an unfulfilled dream. So there is something to work on. When people are frustrated, they actually, in the bottom of it all, like to get out of it. So if you're a good facilitator, you have the first step there. Um, Sorry, Ricardo, did you have something to add? Yeah, there's another question on the chat. And then probably five more minutes with open mic to see if anyone wants to engage. And, 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 um, and then we might close it if no one does mm -hmm. engage, but uh, Axel, an interesting question about how do you analyze the effectiveness, the effectiveness and performance of the critical variables that you determine at the start. Uh, do you use any data, um, any statistics, any tool to analyze the effectiveness of the, of the, the program you're using? Yeah, yeah, I am. My job is that I'm uh, in, in, in the very smallest detail, I'm, uh, it, I'm uh, only sitting on the bench communicating naturally with players coming out, working with the critical variables. But I'm having, uh, sitting there, working with all types of uh, personal assisting about uh, numbers of assists, according to scores, to according to tackles and things like that, con connected to the individual one. Uh, so I'm working with that. And I'm also working in periods with the period with, that we could have a game in the game. 
because you could have one or two, three players, like one of the uh, listeners have been talking about, who's maybe not right there right now. And then we decided, instead of thinking about the result, then we go on the pitch and we have a process, we have a game plan against this opponent. But at the same time, you and me, as a left wing, a line player, no matter what, play goalkeeper. We have two or three of these critical variables, which we especially would like to analyze and to make statistics on in this match. So you have to do this with your legs as a goalkeeper. You have to do stand there as with your arms or things like that. And we can have a discussion on the bench during that, uh, during the match. That we have a team goal, we have a game plan, we have a process going on on the team level. But we also have some personal stuff, one or two or three of us. Uh, and we like to make specific statistics about that during the match. Thanks, Axel. Um, from my perspective, um, it's been great listening to um, not the final version of Axel, you know, just the current version of, of Axel's uh, stance and position on, on coaching. Exactly. Um, maybe it would be interesting before we drop the call to talk about um, maybe one or two of the biggest mistakes that you, you consider you made as a younger coach. Uh, when we were talking before, when you were talking before, there was this triangle around awareness and trust. Uh, and uh, choice, um, maybe something connected to that because a lot of the people in the chat are talking about the culture and this, these type of things. Any, any big mistakes you made and something that you uh, would advise against uh, other coaches making? Yeah, uh, you could say uh, my, my first answer would be that, that maybe I sometimes have, uh, have, uh, haven't, I haven't started uh, I have been proactive enough. Maybe I have been, been too uh, busy, too stressful about uh, integrating a system like this. Uh, and maybe sometimes in periods where you think now we have to do something very, very different because now we're in a bad period of things like that. I think it's very important in this situation that I've learned that if you want to do things like this as an as your way of interact, then it's a long-term way you have to, to make a draw and say, now we'll try to do this. Uh, so it's very, very much about timing and maybe my timings ha haven't been the best uh, in my history. Exactly. In that situation, yeah. Um, so so uh, that's, that's the one thing. And the next thing is that when you're starting up things like this, you naturally are creating frustration and you will have players who don't uh, who think you're a, you're a, you're an idiot that, um, <laughs> that and and the older the older you get it's easier for you to say yeah you are you have had a you have hired an idiot uh, i can live with that we're moving on uh, so so in the beginning maybe i was too much influenced on different approaches you have to to follow this line and 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 and, uh, and, and um, but but it's, it it had to be done very easily, little by little, and explained little by little, on a, and it had to be a long term. Uh, you also need maybe the club, the board, to tell them that now we're working uh, on different terms and maybe we have to use the next season for that. Okay, Axel, there's one more question, and I imagine it's. Um... Uh, something that you're, you're used to, but uh, how much is the um, video worth, you know, from the matches and the training when you're observing the critical variables? Do you often find, um, and I'm paraphrasing the question from Pedro, a former colleague of mine, but um, do you find there's sometimes a difference on the match day when you're observing on the match something that the players are seeing and feeling compared to the, when you watch it back on a video? You know, how, how is there any uh, discrepancy, any difference uh, between the feelings on the day and then in reflection on the video? Uh, can, can you put a, one or two more words on that just to be 100 precise about the answer? Sure. So you, you've, uh, you're working with the players during the match, you're on the bench, uh, yeah. for, you're giving some feedback and having discussions with the players on the, on the day yeah. of the match, but then in uh, the two days after, you're watching the video of the match you know, making some yeah. uh, analysis. Um, yeah. Do you often find, or do you ever find, that there's a difference between uh, what actually happened on the day 
and then what actually happened on the video? You know, is there any um, crossover or differences? Yeah, naturally, because it, 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 you can't control in this situation, just like I told you before, when we are in a match, it's naturally the result is, is always an issue. Uh, so you can say we have, uh, and you are in a very stressful situation. Uh, so, so, so that could sometimes be big differences between that. But, but uh, we know that uh, if from a learning perspective. So, and then it was before, during, before the match, during the match, and then it's so important to say, okay, according to what did we, what did we talk about? So there's also an after. There's also a feedback, feed forward situation. According to these two situations, when we have big trainings and we have mats, then we need one more. This is after. We have, need to have a discussion. Yeah, there was a big difference between these two situations. Uh, what was the critical variable? What, what was what type of critical values was a part of that? And sometimes in that situation, it's very much that it's especially his way of acting before he got the ball that made the difference. He wasn't that stressful in the situation. It was a thing. Oh, we have a lot of well-known guys now. Yeah. Now you're away, Bob, for me. Ricardo. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Thank you, mate. Um, Axel, um, just before we wrap things up, uh, we're going to ask the participants if they want to ask any questions, uh, they can unmute their mic and use, the, use some time now to ask you anything specific that isn't in the already been answered. So guys, feel free to unmute and ask Axel any, any questions and we'll try to manage it. Hello? Bear with me a second. Yeah, hi. Hello? Hi. Hi, it's Steve Dover from Shropshire Handball. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Ricardo. Um, hi. Has Axel got any ideas about um, how to actually replicate the, uh, the, sort of the pressures of matches in, uh, in training? We all have players who perform very, very well in training sessions, but put them in a match and their performance doesn't actually match up. So how does he actually replicate the, 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 the pressures of matches within training sessions? Great question, Steve. Axel, did you get that? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. According to my presentation here, uh, then naturally it's a it, you have the, the difference now in, in the training. Just to explain it, in the trainings you're working with your performance and with your process. And then you come into matches. Then the result uh, uh, issue is uh, throwing all the other things away. Uh, you could say that. Yeah. So from my point of view, it, it just like I told you before, um, first of all, naturally, you, you, you one way or another uh, must see how close you can get in your trainings to different types of match situations, uh, all types of interruptions, uh, head, uh, ears, uh, body, all kinds of interruptions. Uh, you must deal with and tell the guys why you're working with this. But the other thing is, it's something also before, I think, that uh, just like I told you before, I know that there's a big difference from this player's uh, performance in the training and then in the match. Because he's forgetting his performance. He's maybe not fo uh, focused uh, on the process and he's too much focused on the, the results. Uh, what do I have to do? Then we have to, to, to see how can we make this trip very easy. Because we can make it easy by building up uh, what are we working on now in trainings. Because these two or three critical variables, you and me, we are working on them because we are, we are using them in the second half, uh, second part of first half and things like that. So we have to work on that. We have to, to think about it. Uh, can you, that, that's, 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 Things and then we're bringing in our critical variables in the mats. So try to get it as close as possible uh, in that situation. Uh, that's that. That will be my my answer about it. Um, to the thing about what, how close are we to a match? Um, actually, one of my colleagues, Mr. Peter Bristoff Larsen, in uh, BSH, he's talking about sometimes stopping the matches 
sorry, uh, a match in a training or a drill in a training, and then you said to people, hey, according, is this match relevant? We have done some, we have made a goal now, and we have maybe playing in the second division. Stop the last two, three minutes, please. We have a timeout now. These passes, these uh, assists, these way of screenings, these tackling, how close were they? Uh, how relevant were they according to a match situation? Is it just, and then uh, maybe sometimes even ask the players on a level for one to five, five is high level match um, situation. One is training, only this far away from, where, where are we now? What can we do? Things like that. So maybe use the timeouts just for a short break. Uh, and then think about it in that way, then still using the critical variables. The closer you can bring the critical variables or into your small performance goals in a match, then you know what you're doing in the trainings. And if you're doing it in a whole position, then many players are hopefully trying to reach their highest level. Thanks, I have, Steve. For Steve a goalkeeper, I could, I could say to a goalkeeper, yeah, it's enough. Yeah, thank you. Well, I was going to ask Steve, if, Steve, did you want to ask Axel anything in addition to that question? Did it? Um... Yeah, I guess the other thing I'd ask is, does he use competitive um, situations in training? So you might, for example, have wingers competing against each other to see how many goals they can score or goalkeepers, how many penalties they can save. Yeah, yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah. We have all kinds of... You, you know all about that. I can understand that naturally we have... Uh, competitive training nearly every time because you can build in a match in all types of, uh, of trainings. It's just about finding the right level about it. And especially if you have a match against two position and their critical variables, it's very interesting. So they actually you. use it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, guys, any, anything else for Axel before we wrap the call up? Okay, then um, I'm going to give the floor back to Axel for any uh, finishing remarks, Axel. Anything that you want to leave the guys with? Any lasting impressions? Yeah, uh, I know maybe that it's a controversial uh, lesson, this situation here. And um, because uh, actually, and I'm not 100% sure about uh, everything because I think that's a brilliant thing about handball, that it's an open game. It can always be played in another way by others. Always. So, so it's maybe about bringing in your own philosophy and uh, make your own mistakes uh, and be a little bit unsecure, have a little bit more questions than answers in your daily work. Then you're always on the way. Uh, and um, so it's about building up a culture. I think it's in a culture about performance and processes where uh, we can accept each other's roles as coaches and as players um, <clears throat> that's that's giving uh, that's challenging everyone no one's is bringing in their own way of looking upon the world everything is open that's that's uh, that's very uh, that's bringing a lot of pulse and and, and and very constructive although no matter if you're 20 or you're nearly 70 as I am Axel, what a what a fantastic uh, speech to finish on um, embracing the uncertainty asking yeah. more questions and having answers and being very curious about how we can develop uh, our knowledge and expertise in, in how we coach our players. Okay. Um, Axel, thank you so much from myself and my colleagues at England Handball. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you about this project. The same um, here. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been great. Thank you so much, guys. And um, I hope everyone that's listening is, is safe and well. And hopefully we'll catch you on Friday uh, for our third installment, which is looking at junior club engagement. Uh, thank you so much, Axel. All the thank best, you. guys. See you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you Axel. Much. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Let's stay together. Thank you. Absolutely. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Well, right.